So in this lecture on gender, I want us to think about inequality and progress. So gender as a mode of social organization is deeply tied to inequalities. So not just inequality, there isn't just gender and inequality, but there are a range of inequalities tied to gender. Now, the reason I use the plural here and scholars use the plural is partially because, as I noted in a different lecture, of the intersections between gender and other social phenomena. So that there, there is no singular inequality of gender. Instead, there are a range of inequalities to gender, particularly insofar as gender is tied, bound up with, or intersects with other social relationships. And in this lecture, I'm going to give you some examples of feminism. Feminism, which is can be defined quite differently, but I'll think of as the sort of radical position that women are equal to men and should be equal to men, which for some reason is radical from my set of um, uh, positions is not that radical. In fact, um, I think it should be our baseline. But I want to give you some examples of feminist um, um, principles. And in particular, I want to raise up questions of intersectional feminism or how it is that feminism may take and should take a more intersectional perspective. I'll also ask how inequality has been entrenched within social institutions, and in particular, like the workplace. This helps us think a little bit about how inequality is structured and structured by gender. So I'm going to think about and talk about institutions as gendered institutions and ask what it means to think about such institutions as gendered. Part of the idea there will be that institutions have logics or they have ways in which they're structured and that those logics or those structures have gendered assumptions built into them such that the institutional arrangement itself produces certain kinds of gender inequality. And I'm going to ask what kinds of progress have been made towards greater equality. And it's important to note that there has been considerable progress over the last century of gendered uh, of progress. Finally, I'm not just going to talk about the experiences of women. I also, in this lecture, am going to talk about the experiences of men. Because some inequalities disadvantage men. Um, some experiences of masculinity create disadvantages for men, and I want us to think through that, think through other forms of inequality that aren't just about the ways in which women experience disadvantages, but also the ways in which men experience disadvantages. Overall, you'll hear me in this lecture and in a range of lectures sometimes make moral arguments and those moral arguments may be founded in data, but they're also founded in a series of commitments that I have to the world and beliefs that I have about the world. As someone who's teaching you, I'm going to try and be clear in different moments in time when it is that I'm making arguments that are based in what I think of as really well-designed methodological studies that generate insights, and when it is that I'm sort of relying on my own moral commitments about what I think the world should be like. I don't hide those moral commitments. I don't suggest that they're somehow absent from my life, but I do try and make them a little bit transparent. And I believe personally as a social scientist that a science without morality is not really worth pursuing that it's important actually to have moral commitments about the world, to be clear about what they are, and to have them evaluated relative to the sets of information that we gather. And sometimes I may even hold on to my moral commitments, even in light of evidence. And we'll think about what that means over the course of a range of lectures. So first, I wanna talk about feminism. What is feminism? How do we make sense of um, uh, 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 feminist perspectives? Across the world, sociologists and social scientists in general have documented persistent gender inequality. In almost every nation, I would say actually in every nation, we see the ways in which there is an unequal distribution of goods by gender. And in particular, 
that people who identify as women are more disadvantaged than others. So this, to me, is a social problem. I haven't really used that phrase before, but it emerges out of a Durkheimian tradition, out of a particular tradition in sociology that thinks about the differences that we observe potentially as problems. If you think about Durkheim for a moment and some of the things that we learned about Durkheim, Durkheim made a distinction between the normal and the pathological. And he suggested that the pathological was something that was a social problem, that was a social issue that might require some degree of intervention. Interestingly, Durkheim might not have thought about gender inequality as a social problem, in part because Durkheim would have said, well, insofar as gender inequality exists in every single society that we can look at, it seems normal. It's a form that we should just accept. I am not going to support that position of Durkheim's, in part because I identify as a feminist personally. Now, though we often use the singular term feminism, it really refers to a collection of movements that advocate for the equality of all sexes and genders. And so I, as a person in the world, am a feminist in part because I would advocate for equality of all sexes and genders and that this is an important commitment of mine. Now, what that equality means isn't totally clear. And I'm going to like spend a little bit of time on this now, but when we get to our lectures on social stratification and inequality, I'll spend a lot more time on what equality means. Because equality could mean that people with different skills have different outcomes and that that's important, or it could mean that everyone has the same amount. So um, there are different visions of what equality means, and it's important to be clear about that. For now, we're not really going to think about that. We're just going to say that we, some people, particularly those who identify as feminist, often are committed to the idea that there should be equality for all sexes and genders, and that it's important to realize that, and that instances where there's inequalities for sex and for gender, or across sex and gender, are instances that, are, that we should intervene in in some way or try to create a range of social and institutional policies to correct that difference. In the United States, the movements, feminist movements, stem from a broad coalition of primarily women, almost overwhelmingly women, who historically fought for a wide range of rights, or for a variety of rights. Those rights included the right to vote, which they acquired in the early part of the 20th century, the right to be educated, the right to have custody of their children, the right to own property, the right to get married and divorced when they wished, and the right to have access to the same career choices as men. It's important to note, for those of you who are American, that for most of American history, women did not have the right to vote. Um, and this was something that, that women had to fight for. And feminist movements were at, this, at the core of this. But they also lacked other kinds of rights, the right to education. And in fact, women were often limited in the amount of education that they could have, formally limited in that amount of education. The right to have custody of their own children. So sometimes, either when their husbands passed away or when they split with their husbands, the children were considered property of the husband, literally property of the husband, and women did not have a right to them. The right to own property. So for, in different contexts, women have not had the right to own things. They could only own things through their association with men. Either that is their fathers owned something and they could be tied to that object, or their husbands owned something. This right to ownership was centrally important. Marriage and divorce are rights that women often did not experience. Now, you might say, but of course, women got married. But think for a moment about the tradition of men asking a woman's father for the right to marry her. What that tradition is, is in part 
a recognition that fathers own their daughters and that you need permission from a father to own your wife. Now, this is a pretty like radical position, except that it wasn't that radical. It was fairly common for long periods of time. That is, men were allowed to make choices about their um, marriage. Um, not always, but within some sets of limits. But they didn't have to ask permission of um, uh, their fathers. Sometimes they did, but often they didn't. They simply had the right to make decisions about their own trajectories. Whereas women, women were simply owned by men, were controlled by men. And the permission to ask a father for his daughter's hand in marriage was to transfer women from one household to another. So the ability to make one's own choices about marriage and to um, be able to terminate that marriage are rights that women fought for, rights that were part of feminist movements. It's important to note that in the United States, there was no concept of marital rape for a very long period of time. In some states, even now, categories of rape, that is non-consensual sex, require huge degrees of differences, whether or not women are married to men, because it's seen that women don't really have the right, or has been seen, that women didn't really have the right to say no to their husbands when their husbands wanted to have sex. So for example, some states, even to this day, require a huge amount of things for sex to be considered non-consensual within a relationship. You have to have used a weapon. It has to be reported within 30 days. These are big, big differences. And in some ways, a recognition that once women enter into a marriage with a man, the man has a right to her body. Feminism fights against this and has consistently fought against this. What I want you to recognize is that these feminist struggles are not just about wages. It's not just about like work and pay. I'm going to talk a lot about work and pay as a form of inequality, but there are many other inequalities. Inequality in the capacity for political participation, inequality in the capacity to engage in civil society or in public life in different ways, inequality in the capacity to make decisions for yourself, inequality in the capacity to make decisions for other people, inequality in effect in your very personhood or the recognition of your own agency. And part of the equality that feminists, of which I identify, would struggle for, fight for, and seek to realize in law is a recognition of the equivalent human agency of women as compared to men. That women have the same rights and capacity to make choices for themselves as men would. Today, there are multiple feminisms. And people of all genders call themselves feminists. There are men who identify as feminists and women who identify as feminists. There are women who don't identify as feminists and men who don't identify as feminists. And feminism also inter exists in an intersectional perspective. And um, importantly today, there are struggles within feminism. So some feminists are deeply critical of other feminists. You may hear at some point in time the phrase white feminism. And white feminism is a criticism that feminists, intersectional feminists, place upon white feminists. And it's not that those feminists are necessarily white in their own racial identity. It's that they don't consider, at least as the critique goes, the experience of a wide variety of women. So they don't consider the experiences of black women or they don't, experience, they don't consider the experience of trans women. Trans women are women who were assigned the gender of male at birth, but currently identify as female. And so trans women might suggest that 
some feminists, and in particular, quote unquote, white feminists, only consider cisgender women when they fight for rights. And cisgender women refers to those women whose gender identity at birth was female and whose gender identity currently is female. So cisgender are those women whose gender identity at birth was female. And trans women are people whose gender identity at birth, assigned at birth, was male or something else and who currently identify as female. And some feminists will fight over whether or not their feminism is encapsulates the intersectional identities of people who consider themselves women. So does that feminism capture the experience of working class women or women of different racial and ethnic identities or women with different gendered identities? That is whether or not it captures the experience of only cisgender women or does it also capture the identity of trans women? And so we should think about feminism as a diverse set of movements that are all, in some ways, advocating for the equality of all sexes, but that some of those movements come from an intersectional perspective, which is to say they see the necessity of feminism intersecting with racial politics or class politics or politics relative to sexuality, And some of those movements attempt to frame themselves as more universalistic, which is to say that they simply say, no, 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 we don't need to think about all those intersections. We just need to think about the experiences of women, by which they often mean cisgender women. Not always, but often. So why has there been any progress relative to um, gender equality? Well, I think that there's a few explanations. Some is the opening of economic markets, but some and a lot of it is really political movements, socio-cultural movements fought primarily by women that are based on arguments of the moral necessity of equal rights. Now, one of the great challenges um, that remains today is a set of institutional level inequality. And by institutional inequalities, what we mean is how it is that institutions and organizations have a structure that end up resulting in gendered inequality. Some examples of this would be having your authority questioned, being interrupted consistently, sets of expectations about behavior, and unwanted sexual advances. And I'll spend a good bit of time on that last one in the next slide. But If we think about who gets listened to or who has ideas attributed to them or who's expected to be kind, we see that often these assumptions are deeply gendered. So there's a survey of 210 women in the technology industry, specifically the Silicon Valley, for a project called Elephant in the Valley. And um, this was a survey of women who who said, you know, 47% of the women reported that they were asked to do lower level tasks that that male colleagues were not asked to do, such as taking notes and ordering food. So you can imagine a women and men who have the same job, they have the same job categorization, but the women are said, why don't you take notes during this meeting or can you order us lunch? And these are lower level tasks that men aren't asked to do. And nearly half the women said that this consistently happened. 87% of the women experienced demeaning comments from male colleagues so that their male colleagues said things to them that were dismissive of their opinions. Two-thirds of them felt excluded from network opportunities because of gender. So they uh, experienced what we might refer to as a boys club or an experience where men socialized with one another and that they as women were not given access to that socialization. And somewhat astonishingly, 60% reported unwanted sexual advances, with many of those advances coming from superiors. In other words, women were, were solicited for some kind of sexual contact in ways that were unwanted, and that this happened from their bosses. It didn't just happen from peers. All of these things are interactional dynamics in firms 
that produce some degree of gender inequality. Being demeaned at work, being excluded from network opportunities, being sexually harassed, all of these are gendered interactional experiences that produce some inequalities. But we don't just need to think about interactions as producing inequalities. We can also ask how institutional level policies can generate inequalities and how it is that formally neutral policies could have gendered effects. What do I mean by that? Well, when scholars think about formally neutral policies and how such policies can have gendered effects, what they're talking about is policies that don't articulate any differences between genders, but insofar as society around an organization is gendered, they'll have disparate impacts on women as opposed to men. So right now in the United States, as I'm lecturing to you, there are, um, many of us are um, working from home. Um, um, many of us who are able to work from home are actually deeply fortunate that we're able to do that. But in an attempt to address this COVID crisis, many of us are working from home. Working from home appears to be a formally neutral policy. That is, it doesn't really make distinctions between women and men. But working from home can have deeply disparate impacts on women and men. Why? Because the social organization of the home often has women who do far more housework and child rearing than men. So women's workplaces suddenly become places that have far more frequent interventions into their daily lives, and in particular, into their daily work lives. And the impact of this is that women may be less able to achieve the same amount of work as men. So here, you have a formally neutral policy, but nonetheless, because of the gendered organization of society in the home, we would expect a disparate impact experienced by women. Now, you may say, well, it shouldn't be the case that, that's, that that happens, but here I want to point to the work of Arlie Russell Hochschild, who is a sociologist who wrote a really classic, famous book called The Second Shift. And The Second Shift is based on work that Hochschild did, where she observed the ways in which women tended to work not just one shift, which is to say in labor markets, but that they did a second form of labor. It was very important, actually absolutely essential for the reproduction of society. That second shift was a shift where women performed housework. And importantly, the housework that women performed had a very different structure than male housework. So what does this mean? Well, partially the idea that men have household tasks to do, but often men's household tasks have a high degree of flexibility to them. So, you know, an example of this, not, not everyone necessarily experiences this, but it, 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 it's fairly common. Men may be responsible for, say, the cars in the household and changing the oil for those cars. And they either do this themselves or they go to the shop in order to have the oil changed. This is a household task. It's something that needs to be done. But changing your oil happens at about every 3,000 miles that you drive. And men have an opportunity to do that task over really a couple weeks, right? You don't actually have to do it the moment you reach 3,000 miles. You could do it at 2,900 miles, you could do it at 3,200 miles, it doesn't really matter. And so in this sense, there's a flexibility to the men's tasks that they do. Women, by contrast, perform a series of tasks that are relatively inflexible and that require them to work considerably more than men in household tasks. So an example of this is that women in general are often assigned the task of cooking. Cooking is not like changing the oil. You can't decide, you know what, I'm not going to make dinner tonight. I'll just do it tomorrow, right? That is, a, that is not a choice that you can legitimately make. I mean, maybe you can make that choice if you're going to order in or something like that. 
But dinner has to be ordered. It has to be produced by someone within the family. Otherwise, people don't eat. And so we should think about how the gendered organization of work impacts in disparate ways men and women. In this sense, a range of institutional decisions and arrangements help produce gendered patterns of inequality. And the production of those gendered patterns of inequality is deeply consequential. What we need to look for then is not, are not only policies that are explicitly biased against women. So policies that may punish women, for example, insofar as um, uh, they punish people who have children, right? Um, and particularly um, uh, uh, this affects women in part because women are the people who experience pregnancy and have to give birth. That is a gendered, a formally biased gendered policy. But we also might look at the ways in which institutional policies which appear neutral are not neutral, in part because gender is entwined in the organization of all kinds of things outside of work, including the family, but many other institutions. And so when we think about institutional inequality, be that the motherhood penalty or the fact that women, when they have children, end up making less money, whereas men, when they have children, end up making more money, this is a clear example of some patterns of inequality, in addition to those to certain formal policies that produce inequality, we may also think about how seemingly neutral things can nonetheless create patterns of inequality. But not everything is seemingly neutral. And it's important to recognize that one of the patterns of inequality is in relationship to sexual violence. So women and girls experience sexual violence at enormously high rates. And gender is a key factor in violence that occurs in schools. There are two things that I want you to think about here. The first is that women disproportionately experience sexual violence. But the second is that men disproportionately experience both violence and commit violence. In this sense, violence and assault are hugely gendered as a phenomenon. <coughs> Excuse me. Overall, when we look at violence, we see it's disproportionate ways in which men commit that violence, and in particular forms of violence, specifically sexual violence, the ways in which it's disproportionately experienced by women. And if we take a broad perspective here, that is, we think broadly about how it is that that violence is experienced, one of the things that we realize is that that violence and assault are disproportionately experienced by transgender people. So it's not just women who are experiencing violence. We need to think beyond a gender binary or a gendered context of cisgendered people and see how transgender people are ex experience rates of violence that are enormously high. In fact, the Bureau of Justice Statistics here in the United States, Office for Victims on Crime, so these are official crime reports, finds that one one half to two thirds of trans people are sexually abused or assaulted at some point in time in their life. This should be shocking to you. Um, I, I mean, I hope it is. Uh, and I'll just repeat it. Transgendered people are experience rates of uh, sexual abuse or sexual assault that are one half to two thirds of them. So that was not very clear. So let me be a little bit clearer. One half to two thirds of transgendered people will experience sexual abuse or sexual assault in their life. That is much higher than any other group. One out of six American women will be the uh, victim of an attempted or completed rape in her lifetime. That is an exceptionally high rate. One out of six women will be the victim of attempted or completed rape over the course of her lifetime. The biggest risk period is going to be early in her lifetime. So young women, ages 16 to 19, are four times more likely than the general population to experience sexual violence. Young women are particularly at risk. This tells us how gender is deeply entwined with experiences of violence. 
Transgender people have massive rates of sexual abuse and sexual violence. Women experience high rates of attempted or completed rape. Young women are four times more likely than the general population to be victims of sexual violence. We also know that men experience these things. So men are also make up 10% of rape victims. It's pretty high. It's like it's only 10%. And given that they make up 50% of the population, it's they're far less likely, but it's not like men are excluded from this phenomenon. But these experiences are also intersectional. So building off the previous lecture on intersectionality, we know that Native American women are at greater risk of sexual violence than women from other social groups. So being a woman is not the only thing that explains experiences of sexual violence, whether or not you're transgendered. So a trans woman will explain some of an elevated risk So there's an intersection between gender and um, whether or not you identify as trans. But so too does race matter in some instances. There are some racialized differences, and in particular, Native American women in the United States who, in general, are disadvantaged considerably, have higher rates of sexual violence than women of other racial groups. This is to say that gender and violence are socially organized and deeply intersectional. I'll finally note that it's not that men are excluded from these processes. So many of the examples I've given are are of women, but we should think about what it means that men commit violence at very high rates and that men have other kinds of inequalities that they experience, in particular early death. Now, some of their early death is biological. Some of the early death that men experience, um, that is, men die at younger ages than women, is a biological experience. And what I mean by that is that there are different levels of hormones and other kinds of things in men that put them at slightly greater risk of things like heart attack and certain kinds of things that will lead them to an early death. But it's not only biological. Men are at risk of dying at younger ages because men murder other men. Men commit violence to other men. Men experience what we might call a form of toxic masculinity, or that masculine expressions that men are expected to perform have negative health outcomes on men. Right now, I'm lecturing to you at a time of COVID. Men are dying of COVID at higher rates than women. Some of this is because that men have higher rates of comorbidities. Some of this has to do with other kinds of things. For example, men are less likely to take protective actions around COVID in part because they understand such actions as threatening their masculinity. And so ideas of masculinity often lead men to engage in more risk-taking behavior, which literally kills them at younger ages. So men are getting, men are much less likely to wear masks right now. They're much less likely to wash their hands. And this is literally killing them at higher rates. Here then, part of the inequalities of gender, we can think of as forms of gendered oppression, but that some of that gendered oppression is tied to expected performances that men might have which is that the proper performance of masculinity for men involves not wearing a mask, not washing your hands, thinking that you're strong or not susceptible to risks, and that these kinds of risk-taking behaviors are disproportionately practiced by men and result in all kinds of negative health outcomes for men. So with that, we begin to see some of the inequalities that are experienced by gender, which is to say by both men and by women, how some of them are tied to experiences of violence, which we'll talk more about in a subsequent lecture, not just in relationship to gender, but more generally, and in particular, how those gendered inequalities are socially organized and intersectional.